Once again, our text is Jonah chapter 4. I'm, I'm going to start with Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, so we have a little bit of context. Uh, once again, this is God's word for God's people. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should, I, and should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle, This is God's word for God's people. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word and, and for the way that it speaks to us with a power that is indeed supernatural. We pray now that you will be with us as we study your word, as we seek to understand it better, that your word may be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. These things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we all know the story of Jonah don't we? At least we think we do. When I was a child, I suspect that Sunday school teachers got probably more mileage out of this story than just about any other story in the Old Testament. We all remember how God told Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach against the wickedness of the city, how Jonah instead went in the opposite direction. He jumped on a ship and then a fierce storm arose, and the sailors were wondering, okay, who's responsible for this misfortune? And Jonah says, I am. And he suggested that they throw him into the sea, which they did. And then, of course, he was swallowed by a great fish. This is the narrative that we all know and love. And unfortunately, the story usually stops there. Uh, and if we stop there, there are some, th some not so good things that can happen. For example, I suspect that some children come away with, with the lesson that if you don't obey God and travel by sea, some really bad things might happen to you. And that's, that doesn't necessarily reinforce a view of God that's necessarily helpful. Another possible problem is that if we stop the story too soon, uh, we can give people the sense that the Bible is simply a bunch of big fish stories. And uh, uh, there's a lot more going on here, of course. Well, the passage that we read this morning is less familiar, but it's crucially important. It's time for, as Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. And I would add here that it really is important to read biblical texts in full. Uh, God's word is, 
is powerful. It speaks to us with a complete reliability, but, uh, but we need to read the whole thing. And we're going to come back to this at the end of the sermon. Well, God once again tells Jonah to go to Nineveh, the capital of the great Assyrian Empire, to proclaim the judgment of an almighty God against terrible wickedness. And this time, probably not surprisingly, Jonah does what he's told. He spent three days preaching divine judgment against the city. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown, he says. And amazingly enough, the people of Nineveh responded. They responded with repentance. Everyone from the king to the least person in the city put on sackcloth, which was the traditional sign of mourning in the ancient Near East. And they, and they called upon God to be merciful to them. And Jonah's reaction to all this may surprise us. An entire powerful pagan city has repented of its sins and sought God's mercy and God's forgiveness. Jonah is the Billy Graham of the 8th century B.C. <laughs> he should be thrilled with what God is doing through him. And yet Jonah has a very different reaction, doesn't he? We read in verse 1 that that it uh, displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry. It's difficult to render the Hebrew of this verse into smooth English, but what is being said here is very, very emphatic. We might render it something like this. This was a great wrong to Jonah. He was displeased and he became furious. Jonah was incensed and in his anger and his frustration he cries out to God, and a very revealing prayer it is, too, because here we learn why it was that Jonah fled to Tarshish in the first place instead of doing what God had told him. Now, some people would have fled because they feared that the Ninevites might reject the message. Others might flee to avoid the ridicule that prophets often, often received in the ancient world. Fear of failure might have motivated many people to flee. With Jonah, however, the situation was exactly the reverse. Jonah feared that he would succeed. He feared that his message would be received. Now, let's look at verse 2 again. There we read, and he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Now notice that Jonah seems to have a severe problem with the fact that God is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Here, in fact, Jonah seems to be quoting from a portion of the worship liturgy that would have been recited by the Jews of that time. But on Jonah's lips, what was normally an expression of adoration and praise instead is a matter of disgust and anger. This wonderful description of God's saving, merciful love causes Jonah to wish that he was dead. Now, how can we explain this? How can we make sense of this? This, this doesn't sound very holy or righteous or religious, doesn't it? And yet we have a true prophet of God expressing himself in, in some rather surprising ways. Well, we have to note that Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. You see, Jonah was a loyal Jew. He was a patriotic Israelite, and he had no love for the enemies of his nation, especially the hated Assyrians. And we must admit that Jonah's anger against Assyria was not without foundation. Jonah chapter 1 verse 2 says that the wickedness of the Assyrians had come up before the Lord. And that's an Old Testament way of saying that the wickedness of the Assyrians had reached such a point that God could no longer turn his head. If it continued, God was going to have to do something. 
Now, we know that the Assyrian kings took great pride in their reputation for cruelty. They ruled with an iron fist. When they conquered a city, they often slaughtered many of the people in it. They controlled their empire by, by deporting entire populations. Everywhere they went, they left misery, hardship, and death. And it's not surprising that Jonah was not a fan of the Assyrians. In fact, the Old Testament has very little good to say about them. For example, the prophet Nahum writing about the city of Nineveh, uh, writing about the city of Nineveh about a century after the prophet Jonah says, woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder, no end to the prey. So we see that the Assyrian inhabitants of Nineveh were idolatrous, they were cruel, they were corrupt. And I think we can imagine Jonah relishing the thought of Nineveh's destruction. Uh, perhaps he even spiced up the message with references to Sodom and Gomorrah and God uh, visiting fire upon sinners. After all, Jonah thought the Assyrians deserved to be toasted. That's the way he thought. Now, here, we, here I think we have an interesting lesson in the dangers of what we might call my country right or wrong patriotism. Yes, patriotism is good, but it can blind us to God's larger purposes for the world. And that was certainly the case here. Well, we see in Jonah's prayer and in his behavior that he knew a thing or two about God's law and God's justice. He also apparently knew some things about God's mercy and love. He does, after all, directly quote the part um, in the Jewish liturgy about God being gracious and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Now, it's... It is, I think, interesting to note that we find virtually the same language about God in Exodus 34, verse 6, in Psalm 86, verse 15, in Nehemiah 9, 17, and in Joel 2, 13. But there is one crucial difference between these passages that I just mentioned and Jonah Jonah uh, chapter 4, verse 2. In all these other passages, uh, God is gracious and merciful in his dealings toward Israel. And Jonah thought it was a great wrong that God would be gracious and merciful toward anybody else. How can God behave this way, Jonah thought? After all, we're God's chosen people, not them. We're the good guys. They're the bad guys. Sound familiar? It's easy to fall into that way of thinking, isn't it? Well, with the benefit of hindsight, we, we do recognize that Jonah had forgotten a thing or two. We know from Scripture, for example, that God did not choose Abraham, the father of the Jews, because he was any more righteous than anybody else in the ancient Near East. The only reason given for God's choice of the people of Israel is his saving merciful love. We also see in Genesis 12, 3, that God chose Abraham and his descendants so that they in turn might someday be a blessing to all peoples on the earth. Well, what was God's reaction to Jonah's outburst? It's interesting to me at least as a theology professor, that God does not give Jonah a lecture in systematic theology. <laughs> that would be my response, but thankfully I'm not God. Jonah did not need to enroll in Theology 101, the doctrine of God, in order to learn that God is loving and merciful. Jonah's problem was not intellectual. There was something else going on here. What Jonah did need was to, was to see and to experience God's love from a different perspective. And in the remaining verses of this chapter, 
God proceeds in a compelling way to show Jonah and to show us a new perspective on his gracious, compassionate, saving, merciful love. Well, we see in verse 5 that Jonah went out to the east of the city. He built himself a shelter and waited, hoping that he would witness God's violent destruction of the city. Building materials were scarce in the ancient Near East, just as they are in that region now, and we can understand how Jonah's flimsy shelter provided little relief from the hot sun. Then, despite Jonah's spitefulness, God caused a plant. Uh, We don't know what kind of a plant it is. It might be a castor oil plant. Uh, There's been all kinds of speculation. If you're interested in the philological details, you can consult with Dr. Schwab. He can can explain to you at great length why we don't know what it was. But despite Jonah's spitefulness, God causes a plant to grow up during the night in order to give Jonah some added relief from the hot sun. And just as Jonah was very angry about the repentance of the Ninevites, so also he was very happy about the plant. Now we see here, if we're, if we're thinking in clinical mode, as some of the doctors in the audience probably are, that Jonah is apparently given to, my, to some rather wide mood swings. And we'll see this continuing here. Then... The very next day, God sent a worm which wounded the plant so that it withered and died, just as a cut worm might kill the vegetables in our gardens nowadays. Not only that, but the sun began to beat down upon Jonah, and one of those viciously hot, dry, Middle Eastern winds came roaring from out of the east. Now, let's get the picture here. There Jonah sits. Nineveh is still standing. His plant is dead. He's being broiled by the sun, and he can, he can barely breathe because of that hot east wind. Needless to say, Jonah's mood shifts once again. He's angry about the vine. He's angry enough to die. Jonah feels at that moment that his entire existence is wrapped up in this fragile weed which grew up overnight and which died overnight. He's concerned about nothing else at this point. Now, throughout this narrative, Jonah has been sort of a comical figure. Have you noticed that? First, God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh, and Jonah instead petulantly goes in the other direction by sea, only to be swallowed by a great fish. Then Jonah goes to Nineveh, only to see the hated Assyrians actually repent in response to his mission. Jonah can't seem to win, can he? (laughs) Now God uses the irony of this situation to gently teach Jonah and also to teach us a crucially important lesson. God points out that Jonah has been completely wrapped up in this plant, while at the same time, Jonah has no stake in it at all, except for the very temporary comfort that he got from it. Jonah did not plant it. He did not fertilize it. He did not water it. Jonah had nothing to do with the growth of the plant, and yet he was intensely concerned with it. And we see here, do we not, that Jonah's very casual relationship to the plant stands in huge contrast to God's relationship as creator and sustainer to the people of the city of Nineveh. And God goes on to explain to Jonah the depth of his concern for that city. Now, there are two things that we need to notice in particular here regarding God's concern. First of all, there are over 120,000 people in the city. Each one of those people created in God's image, each, each person significant and important to God. We see in the second place that God has a concern not simply for people in general, but for sinful people. 
Jonah had no concern for the people of Nineveh precisely because of their sin. God, as we will see, has a deep concern for the people of Nineveh because of their sin. God's attitude is very different. We see in verse 11 that God characterizes these Ninevites as helpless, as people who do not know their right hand from their left. And uh, that, that seems to suggest, if I'm interpreting this correctly, that the sin of the Ninevites had in fact enslaved them and made them helpless. And that in and of itself was enough for God to take pity on them. It is the nature of sin, is it not, that, that sooner or later it circles back and it bites us? Sin enslaves. Why do you think we live in an age of addictions? Addictions to drugs, alcohol, sex, porn, the internet. The list goes on and on and on. Now notice, notice that the book of Jonah ends with a question. It's one of two books in the Bible to end with a question. The other one, in case you're wondering, happens to be the prophet Nahum. Notice also that we are not told how Jonah the prophet reacted to this question. That is to say, the question continues to resonate down through the centuries to our own time. And this means, I think, that this question is also intended for us. Are we going to share God's concerns? Are we going to get our concerns in line with what God cares about? Together with Jonah, we've been given a graphic object lesson in the depth and the extent of God's loving concern for his creation. The contrast between Jonah's rather silly concern for the plant and God's creator love and concern for the people of Nineveh is a challenge to us here today. It's a challenge to share God's concerns, to care about the things that God cares about, to have the mind of God to care about the things that really matter. It's not easy to see each person we come into contact with as important to God, and by extension, as also important to us. Be, before coming to, to Erskine College in 1993, my family and I lived in Nashville, Tennessee, and at that time, the lower, broad portion of the city had, a, had an awful lot of homeless people. And those pesky panhandlers could be a real problem. And it was very difficult to view those people, many of them addicted to drugs and alcohol and so forth, as precious to God. It was just all too easy to simply pass by and to ignore them. Humanly speaking, caring about those sorts of things is just about impossible. But in the New Testament, we learn that salvation involves a reorienting, a renewing of our minds, a renewing that enables us to share God's concerns, to care about the things that really matter. Paul goes on to further define this, this renewal of the Christian's mind as a matter of having the mind of Christ. That's an interesting way to put it, isn't it? To have the mind of Christ. And at very least, this means sharing the concerns of one who cared enough about sinful people to die for them on a cross. Now we might ask ourselves, how can we have this mind of Christ? How can we share God's concerns so that, so that what's really important to God becomes really important to us as well? Well, St. Paul helps us, helps us at this point as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, which is a passage dealing with the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian, we find that through the Spirit's work, we can have this mind of Christ within us. 
Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 and following. He says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And then we have the kicker. But we have the mind of Christ. Now, we might say that we often don't feel like we have the mind of Christ, and it's true. We often don't feel feel like, like our minds are being transformed in the way that we wish they were. But what we sometimes forget is that having the mind of Christ is a matter of growth. It's a matter of becoming more and more Christ-like throughout our lives. And we grow, first of all, by reading God's Word and by learning about what's, what's actually important to God, what His concerns are. Here, of course, it is important that we not be like Jonah. <laughs> Jonah only focused on those aspects of God's Word that he liked. He ignored the part about God wanting to bless all kinds of people through the seed, of Abraham. If we really want to share God's concerns, we need to pay attention to what an earlier generation of Presbyterians uh, uh, used to call the whole counsel of God. That is to say, the comprehensive witness of God's Word. Now, the bottom line there, of course, is that we need to be reading our Bibles. and We need to be reading large chunks and not simply small snippets. We need to read the whole story. Next, we need to let the Holy Spirit illumine our minds and soften our hearts so that we can begin to act on what God teaches. And then as we learn more more and more about God's will and God's concerns and as we act, act in a way that is consistent with those concerns, we we slowly but surely begin to share God's concerns and to have Christ's mind working itself out in us. Well, God called called Jonah, and he also calls us here today to look at things from God's perspective, to care about the things that God cares about. We might call Jonah a reluctant evangelist, and I suspect that there are a number of reluctant evangelists in the room here this morning, myself included. Uh, And I also suspect that if the truth were told, most of us are reluctant about such things because the things that are important to God are not as important to us as they really should be. And so may God in his grace enable each of us to share his concerns. Let's pray together, shall we? Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful story of Jonah and for how you challenge us to share your concerns, to care about the things that you care about. We pray most of all this morning that we might come to share your mind, that we will get our priorities in line with yours so that the things that are important to you might be important to us as well. These things we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.